Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday morning between 6 and 6.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we will be discussing uh, two parts. Uh, first, my background, how I became an anarchist, uh, voluntarist, and secondly, my, my most recent uh, blog post uh, based on the Larkin Rose video, If You, if you Were King. Uh, so we'll go into that. So first off, um, I've always been um, interested in learning and reading outside of my government indoctrination. And uh, I got my first taste of, uh, of different information, more uh, you know, insightful information than uh, is government approved. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, one of my friends gave me a book, um, Hyperspace by Mishukaku. As a 12-year-old, I was reading that, and that really opened my eyes to various things, astronomy, cosmology. And from there, I just started into many different aspects of, uh, of uh, you know, philosophy, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, um, alternative medicine, Chinese herbs, Native American you know, philosophy, religion, things like that, spirituality. And I was also getting into uh, big time into chess. I'm also you know, pretty heavy chess player. And uh, also piano. I love piano. I um, posted a few videos of, of that and, and YouTube. And I, I just, um, so in various other many things. And, uh, and so I just got more and more into those things as, uh, you know, as my um, high school years went on. And then uh, once I graduated, I, I went to uh, college to learn um, massage therapy, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, and Eastern nutrition. So be basically oriental medicine and um, and that was a great experience I enjoyed that although uh, I wouldn't really recommend anyone go to college now it uh, or university it just doesn't really um, doesn't really make sense anymore to me um, the amount of time that it takes uh, the expense and you know most of the fact that most people don't even have enough money to pay for that and if if you're not one of the fortunates, as I was, to have uh, parents to help assist you uh, and pay for your education, um, you know, if you can, so, some people try to pay themselves through college and, and they can do maybe community college, but then once they get into university, that becomes impossible and they have to force to take out loans, uh, which bog them down and, um, and just, um, you know, throw them into a pit from which it becomes most difficult to uh, climb themselves out of and that's a terrible way to start out life and especially with the internet now and so much information that's free and available um, for anyone that's interested and dedicated to learn it just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to go to an institution uh, to get you know a, a government approved uh, license permit certification for something uh, and and having to pay for that with debt just does not make sense to start out with minus, you know, and just start out as an indentured servant. That does not make sense anymore. So, 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 um, yeah, so that's how I got into Chinese medicine. And then, and then from there, I, uh, I just kept doing more research into philosophy and eventually, uh, <laughs> I discovered, uh, Ron Paul through, uh, I guess uh, he's, he's a big, um, reason for many uh, volunteers for uh, you know for their awakening <clears throat> and during the 2008 elections that was the last time I voted the last time <laughs> I ever voted uh, and the only reason I did vote I didn't, I didn't really care much for politics because you know growing up in my family um, all of my family members are Democrats so they always had heated discussions on um, uh, you know health care on you know the economy on foreign affairs, on, you know, war, on, you know, elections and, you know, who the president should be and who the vice president and who is this and that and that secretary of state. And I just never found it of any interest. It didn't, it didn't seem to apply to my life. It was just a distraction. I wanted to read my books. I wanted to study astronomy and cosmology, theoretical physics, chess, piano. I wanted to study that. That was, to me, was most applicable to my daily life. And, and so I just didn't care about it. You know, I didn't care whatsoever. Uh, but my family was, um, and they still are a pretty firmly democratic family, leftist. So, um, so that's basically how I grew up. And so I was, I was basically um, 
taught that you know the Democrats are the, the saviors, and you know if only we have Democrat more Democrat presidents, you know this country would turn around and uh, you know be rainbows and unicorns flying around, and uh, <laughs> of course <laughs> that's scarcely what happened when Obama entered office uh, in two thousand uh, was that twelve? So um, oh no, sorry, two thousand eight. But, um, but yeah, so Ron Paul got me into, um, you know, he, he got started the, uh, you know, the gears of, uh, of thought into our uh, society, you know, what politics, you know, how that affects us as a, as a species and, you know, is it really necessary? Do we need that? And um, eventually I, I discovered um, some, some of Stefan Molyneux's podcast that really got me thinking as well. Started reading a bunch of books, a big book that really got me into uh, learning more was uh, G. Ed- Edward Griffin, the uh, the creature from Jekyll Island. I read that uh, massive book, but it was an excellent eye opener for me, and it taught me a lot about many great things that um, I repeat many times to my um, my patients at work. I work at a as an acupuncturist in a, a no fault car accident clinic right now, Monday through Friday, sal- salary job, which I am uh, quite looking forward to uh, leaving, although my wife is not. <laughs> So every chance I get, I try to talk about uh, Austrian economics, precious metals, the Federal Reserve, volunteerism, anarchy, libertarianism, uh, non-aggression principle. I try to talk about that as often as possible with my patients because uh, I find that there's just so many people that have never heard of these concepts. And when you present them in a way that's clear and simple and understandable, there is no way that that people that rational sane people can reject them. I just don't see how that can happen. You know, when you say do you use violence to solve problems in your daily life? No. Do you use do you tell someone to use violence on your behalf to solve problems for you? No. So then why is it okay to delegate to politicians the ability that uh the common man does not have, right? Legal plunder, right? If we, if we don't have the ability to steal from our neighbor, how can we elect politicians to steal from them on our behalf, right? If we don't have the ability to, you know, kill uh, foreign people, you know, people from foreign countries, how do we, how can we do that and call it war and it's not murder, right? How, how is that possible? How does that, uh, how do you make that leap <laughs> from, from the morality that applies to the common man to the, the, strange, twisted, and obscene, quote, morality that applies to politicians and their cronies and, and all government officials, right? They seem to operate uh, outside of the laws of morality and the laws of economics that we are all um, subject to. And, uh, and that, just, that just does not make sense. Um, and also, you know, if, uh, if you can't kill somebody, you know, can a group of people kill somebody? No. Can a you know small group or can a large group of people kill somebody? No, it's still murder, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter how large of a group it is; it doesn't change the laws of morality, right? That we are all subject to. And so, um, so yeah, I try to I try to explain to that to my patients as often as possible how these concepts are universal. They're they're you know completely. It must be universal, right? If um, you know if you treat your family and your friends with respect and with dignity and with compassion that they deserve, as long as they treat you right, um, why would you not extend that to the rest of the human race, right? Why would you only treat your family and your friends, right? (laughs) Why would you not treat everyone with compassion and empathy and dignity? Because it just makes sense. It just makes sense, right? As uh, I remember Michael Shanklin uh, posted a... um, uh, on, on Facebook, he, uh, one of his posts was, um, and I never forgot this, I, it, it rang with me, um, you know, if you, if you treat people with decency and respect around you, that's called being a good human being, right? It's called being empathetic. If you, if you extend that to the universal, to the whole of humanity, you become a voluntarist. And, uh, and that really rang true. That, that definitely, you know, I, I don't understand why people consider other people from other countries, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you just, t- if you're assuming that countries is like a, a different world or a different planet, you know, but like as if they're not human beings too, you know, so, you know, um, they must be treated with the same uh, decency and respect 
that you would treat your family member or your best friend. It just, uh, it just makes sense. So, um, so yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I, uh, I talk with my, um, my patients as often as possible. Precious metals is another important uh, topic I, uh, I touch on a lot. It's very important. I have done a lot of reading in uh, Austrian macroeconomics. Uh, it's just, it just makes sense. It's the, uh, you know, governs, you know, natural laws of human behavior. You know, it's not, it's not something that, you know, dry, um, you know, insipid charts and pie graphs and, and percentages and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's saying, how do people behave? You know, and, and extrapolating that, uh, you know, to the large scale, you know, to the, to the free market, right? Because the free market is just composed of people. We're just, <laughs> the free market is just people, peaceful people, engaging in voluntary interaction, right? So uh, when you think about it like that, you know, we're all, we're all just a bunch of people trading and, uh, and buying things, right? Uh, we're all motivated by our own, uh, our own desires, and our own needs, um, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the stuff. So, so with precious metals, you know, I, I talk a lot about, um, I just mentioned the federal reserve and how, you know, I ask people, what is the federal reserve? Most people don't even know what that is. <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> they have no idea. It's really amazing. You know, we, we use this, this paper every single day of our lives. You know, most people, actually most of it's on credit card, debit card, true. But, um, you know, for the most part, people know. You know what a dollar bill looks like. You know, you know, you know, five dollars, twenty dollars. You know, you're familiar with it, right? But people don't even take the time to examine what exactly is written on this piece of paper and why do we consider it valuable? What's the reason, right? Um, and why is it even called a dollar? That's even a, a misnomer, right? Because dollar, uh, when it was first um, before 1913, before the Federal Reserve took over. Uh, um, a dollar was one twentieth of an ounce of gold, right? So twenty dollars would be equal to one ounce of gold. It was a receipt, right? It wasn't. It wasn't money. It was currency. It was more. More specifically, at that time, it was a receipt for money. Just like, you know, when you when you give your coat to the coat check, right? He gives you a receipt. The receipt is not your coat, right? The receipt is the substitute for your coat, right? So the receipt would be the currency, and the coat would be money, right? So that's what our currency used to be. Uh, used to just be a receipt for money, which was gold, right? Which was a one ounce piece of gold. And, uh, and through fiat currency creation and debt and the uh, Mandrake mechanism, uh, people have slowly been used to inflation as if it's a normal thing, as if, uh, you know, it's just a given. <laughs> when in fact, inflation is everyday theft, everyday theft. And when you think about it like that, you think that you work with your effort and time and labor you put into whatever you do and you make this, you earn in this depreciating toilet paper counter, counterfeit confetti garbage. It's insulting. It really is. <laughs> you know, to think that that's what we have to transact in as a society. And the only reason we have to transact in that is because of legal tender laws. And, and I go over, actually, with my patients, I, I take a dollar bill and I, I go over what exactly all the words mean on the dollar bill, right? You have, you know, Federal Reserve note. First of all, you have Federal Reserve note on the top. It says dollar bill on the bottom, but, but more accurately, it's a Federal Reserve note, right? So Federal Reserve would be, you know, the, the, the whole t term of Federal Reserve is not, it's not part of the federal government and it has no reserves, right? So it's not a bank and it's not part of the government's it's a, um, it's a private corporation owned by foreign international financiers uh, who are mostly um, obscure and no one knows much about them <laughs> what they do other than the fact that almost every country on the planet w who has a central bank owes debt to them, right? So they have produced no value in, in life save for um, owning this banking um, empire, this cancer that has spread to almost all countries of the world, except for the countries that we're currently attacking, right? That we currently want to invade, such as North Korea, such as Iran and Cuba, right? So far as I know, three countries, only three countries don't have a, um, a central bank, right? Um, and, uh, and incidentally enough, um, usury or, you know, interest 
was actually banned in um, in the Muslim in uh, in Islam, right? Muslim religion um, usury was banned by uh, by principle. Um, so you know you can see how a society that's based on usury eventually must collapse. It must collapse if there's always interest applied to every loan, right? Interest that does not already exist that a person must pay back, that interest must compound, always, it must always compound. And, uh, and that's the inherent monkey wrench in the system of how it will ensure its own demise, right? So, um, so yeah, so I go into that, and then Federal Reserve, note, right? So note, what does note mean? It, note is basically a contract. It's a promissory note, right? It signifies a promissory note, which is an IOU. Um, so, so you can more accurately, more accurately call our currency um, a contract, right? It's a contract to pay, right? So because we, uh, the, the, uh, the federal government has entrusted the authority to the Federal Reserve to print this money, uh, symbolically, <laughs> most of the time, and loan it to the federal government at interest, of course, by usury. Um, so it's always, you know, every, every, every um, piece of currency that we see is, is as a result of a loan, has come into existence because of debt, right? It all is symbolic of debt, and uh, and this debt will never be paid off, which is why the um, which is why the the national debt is always increasing by leaps and bounds. Always, it must happen, and it will continue to happen as we know since two thousand eight. Um, the the M one money supply has been rising exponentially with Q Q E one, Q E two, Q E three, and it will continue to do so until um, until the wealth transfer occurs. After which we, will, we can only hope that people will regain their good senses and move to a better world free of this, um, you know, f first of all, free of, uh, you know, these, these cancerous bankers as well as uh, the oligarchs and uh, politicians who um, together produce this um, enslaving system that we all live under. So, so, yeah, so that's the Federal Reserve note, and then you have this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, right? What does that mean? Legal tender status means it's, it has a stamp of approval by government that this must be used. It must be used by force, by dictate, right? By threat, threat of imprisonment if we do not use it to pay our, uh, our debts, public and private. There is no question about that. Um, so... So yeah, so so that's that's you know n another example of government um, government monopoly in the currency system, uh, which is another <laughs> one of the one of the most important tenets of uh, of um, Karl Marx's ten planks of communism. Interestingly enough, I, I wrote a recent blog post on that. We can talk about that at a later show. Um, how our country has uh, satisfied basically to the T to the T <laughs> all ten of Karl Marx's. Uh, planks for communism, for you know, to bring about a communistic society, right? So then you have that, and then you have the serial number uh, that's in, that's present on each dollar bill, and that that's basically referring to the uh, the uh, you know the fact that it's also proof that it's actually a product, right? So not only is our is our currency, it's not dollar bills, right? It's Federal Reserve notes, it's currency. You can you can call it currency, but more accurately, it's Federal Reserve notes because you can also have currency that's not um, under government control, right? You have you can have free market currencies. There's many, many, many free market currencies that have existed, right? Such as seashells, salt, sugar, spices, lumber, coal, copper, exotic bird feathers, axe heads, uh, so many, so many things uh, that people have used for currency in lieu of uh, the um, monopoly money that we use today, or funny money. <laughs> As you can call it. <laughs> so you have the serial number, which basically implies that it's a product, right? It's a piece of merchandise, right? And the, the producer is the Federal Reserve. It's their product, right? Just like you have a serial number on a, on a cell phone, on a computer, on a car. You have serial numbers. You know, if there's any malfunction, the, the, what's the purpose of the serial number? To, to uh, um, withdraw, I say, uh, to um, recall their product, right? To recall. So, um, so just a further example, it's, it's just a product. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's really amazing. When you break down the wording on the dollar bill, you can really, it's a really great learning tool and I plan to, uh, I plan to do that a lot. So, so before we go, I have uh, about 10 minutes left. Let me just get into my, uh, if you were king, um, 
uh, blog post. I'm going to just read it and I'm going to talk a little bit about it afterwards. It doesn't matter if you call yourself a member of the Democrat Party, Republican Party, Green Party, Liberal Party, Conservative Party, or even Constitution Party. If you seek to gain access and use of the greatest mafia in the land known as government, then you are just another righteous do-gooder who thinks he knows what is best for everyone else and will use the guns of the state to achieve that goal by any and all means necessary. Even if you are a constitutionalist and seek our government to shrink and only abide strictly according to the U.S. Constitution, you are still advocating for the theft and violence that is justified by a piece of paper with ordinary words. By the way, never in history have pieces of paper ever restricted the insane whims of genocidal megalomaniacs. Millions have died obeying and believing in the myth of government that this piece of paper warrants. In Plato's the Republic, he speaks of philosophers as being the only suitable type of people to rule as king. The analogy is that just as conductors are ideal to lead the orchestra due to their general and extensive knowledge of all the instruments, so too are philosophers ideal to lead the people due to their general and extensive knowledge of human behavior. One vital flaw in this reasoning is that those who populate the orchestra voluntarily decided to join the orchestra and willingly perform under the direction of the conductor. The same cannot be said with people under the rule of government. Nobody asked to be born in a particular country and nobody signed a contract to abide by its commands and regulations. Nonetheless, our, quote, consent to be ruled, end quote, is implicit in our physical presence. Nowhere in any other relationship is this strange situation seen other than that of government and the governed. As Stefan Malnew would say, if you believe you can enter the Leviathan that is government and turn it into a force for good, it is better that you start on a smaller scale first. Try to infiltrate the mafia and turn it into a charity. Try to infiltrate the KKK and turn it into a black brotherhood. Do that and I will believe you can turn the government into a force for good. Fail to do that, and you are just another talking head who speaks in vague deceptions and insignificant tautologies. You are just another petty sociopath who believes he has the answers to all of life's questions, and everyone should live according to your limited understanding of the world. If you really want to make a difference, then lead a life that's worth emulating. Lead by example rather than by decree. If you truly seek to change and improve the world, then first seek to change and improve yourself. People do not follow mere words. They follow virtuous deeds. Stop vying for the, the reins of power. Stop vying for use and control of the gun. Put the gun down. Surprisingly, humans are more creative loving and compassionate when they do not have guns pointed at their heads. And I end with a, a quote by William Shakespeare, Hell is empty and all the devils are here. So this was a great video by, uh, by Larkin Rose uh, talking about the futility of believing that a, there is a perfect person to rule all of us. That one person could have the wisdom and the know-how and the, and the presence to, to understand and accurately predict the complex, infinitely complex, human interactions that occur in the economy all the time. And it is just uh, utter ridiculousness, absurdity, and folly to think that such a person exists. <laughs> I mean, would you ever think that there is somebody who can predict uh, the implications of what would happen in nature. If, let's say, you were to, let's say you were to uh, remove one species. What impact would that have on nature, on other species, on other plant life? What impact would that have on the soil? What impact would that have on the climate? <laughs> do, you, do you honestly think that there's somebody that can predict that? It is insane to think that somebody can predict that. It really is. And it just points to, to me, the, the willingness of people to want to have somebody above them. 
you know, I guess it's like, a, you know, an s and thing, <laughs> a, a, a dominance, you know, uh, a patriarchy thing, you know, like, you know, um, like religion, one of its functions, it seems to me, was to function, you know, God was like a patriarch, right? He looked out for humanity. He set the rules. He punished people according to if they follow his rules or not, right? So, so obviously, God was above the law, right? Because he made the law. <laughs> you could never bring God to justice, right? <laughs> In the same way that that's, this is the way that we treat politicians. You can never bring the president to justice. You can never bring the vice president. You can never bring these people to justice, right? Because they are above the law. You can never bring a judge to justice, you know? How many times have you, uh, have you seen, you know, even, even police officers, right? You know, injuring people, dis dislocating people's arms, breaking people's arms, shooting the wrong person, killing the wrong dog of that wrong house, you know, raping people, killing people. And what do they, what do they get? They get, a, um, they get a slap on the wrist. Sometimes they get a, a vacation. <laughs> they call it time off, paid vacation, of course. Who pays for it? We do. <laughs> and uh, occasionally they go to jail. Maybe one month, two months, they come out, get their job back, right? Can you ever, ever expect somebody from the private sector to have that kind of immunity from being responsible for your actions. Can you ever expect that from, from a, a worker of the private sector? Of course not, right? Because the, the way we view people who do not work for government don't understand this, but the way people in the private sector view um, the people is as customers, right? You would not you would not harass, you wouldn't abuse, you wouldn't uh, you know, rape your customers because you want your customers to come back to you, right? You, uh, they're your life, they're your lifeblood, they're, 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 they're the bread, <laughs> the bread that, that provides you with sustenance. So, so um, you must rely on them. Therefore, you have an incentive to treating people with dignity and with respect, right? <laughs> because you want to earn their patronage. So the same can't be said. So, so therefore, there's, there really is no such thing as a philosopher king. According to Plato, uh, I, and I read The Republic as a, as a high schooler. I read The Republic a few times, actually. I found the book to be fascinating. I mean, I, I enjoy uh, a lot of the ancient Greek philosophy, uh, Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. I, I read a lot of them. Um, but, but now, learning about voluntarism and anarchy and what government is, I now have a new idea and a new thought process on the subject. Um, although there are many things that, that Plato did say that I, I found to be uh, quite admiring. Um, but, uh, but this topic of Philosopher King now, I'm, I'm really now realizing that it just can't make sense since it doesn't matter how virtuous you are, as a king, you always thrive on extortion, right? You always thrive on theft, on power, Right? On putting yourself above the law, you make the laws, right? Therefore, you are above the law. You can't be tried for your, for your rules, right? You can't be tried for your, for your errors, right? Um, you know, Bush is, uh, is, you know, is a war criminal, committed mass murder in Iraq, yet he tore in the country. Well, what is he, painting and writing books and giving lectures and talks and, uh, and people are, you know, loving it, you know? So, you know, we don't, we don't view these people as mass murderers, but that's what they are. They're the, they're the most clever mass murderers. You know, people tell me, they, they tell me, uh, oh, this person, um, you know, this person uh, is, a, is a serial killer. I, you know, I hear this from some of my friends, you know, they, they, they say when somebody is on the news, you know, this person, he killed, you know, 10 people, 15 people. This guy's sick. He's crazy. He deserves to rot in jail for the rest of his life. <laughs> well, what do you call a politician <laughs> if not a mass murderer, right? <laughs> you know, uh, although he didn't commit the crime, Right? He ordered people to do it on his behalf. Right? So uh, somebody has to take the blame. I say everybody takes the blame because um, you, know, you, have, you have the politician that gives the order, you have, he gives it to the general, the general gives the order to the, to the lesser people and the, you know, the, the people on the ground, they go overseas and they, they do all the dirty work, the killing, and they say, I'm just doing my job, I didn't make the law. Right? And then you tell the general, no, I was, I was given the order by the president, and the president says, well... <laughs> <laughs> what is he going to say? You know, so everybody is complicit. Everybody is responsible. The, the, the military man who goes over to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to any other country, to any country, and 
destroys their infrastructure, breaks down, you know, people's doors and, you know, kills innocent women and children. Um, they are as much to blame as the general, as the president. They are all to blame because we always have a choice. We always have a choice. You never, you never can relinquish responsibility of your own actions. This is what it means to be human, okay? We are not machines, all right? We're not automatons, right? <laughs> We're people. We all have a mind, okay? And it behooves us to use that to our best ability. All right, so I'm going to stop right there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. This is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, and I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, um, signing off. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Take care.